Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this IFMI digital masterclass about electrifying your fleet. My name is Steven Schroefs, Chief Editor of Fleet Europe. The IFMI stands for International Fleet Managers Institute. It is the dedicated training and expertise sharing platform for international fleet managers only. The IFMI also triggers innovative thinking in car fleet management. And last but not least, the IFMI focuses on best practice sharing and interaction. And also in this webinar today, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions to our experts. So, first, a little explanation on the topic of today. Although worldwide sales of electric vehicles is increasing, its penetration in corporate fleets is still quite low. It's, let's say, less than 1.5% for Europe in corporate fleets. Of course, this has to do with various elements, like a lack in a nice-looking, price-attractive offering, concerns about autonomy and tech safety, and questions around residual values and concerns about charging possibilities. But all previous elements belong more and more to the past. Next week, for example, we will have the Paris Motor Show, where again, new EVs will be presented that respond to the previous concerns mentioned and the concerns that you and your company might have. And that will make it even more relevant to ask the question, how to include electric vehicles in your strategy. Because the why of having electric vehicles in your fleet is already well understood. There are a few elements that makes it quite interesting to have electric vehicles. For example, a lower CO2 footprint, the tax advantages and fiscal incentives, the employee demand that is increasing for electric vehicles, the accessibility to the city centers, and also a better corporate image. Now, it's not me who is going to drive this webinar of the International Fleet Managers Institute, as we have invited two experts to do so. Let me present to you Matthijs van der Gold of Leaseplan and Pieter Gosses of Atlon. Both experts will give insight in how you can electrify your corporate fleet and first, Matthijs, he will start with a high-level, more general introduction about the topic and then detailing what you can do in terms of fleet electrification. Matthijs, I hope that you are in this webinar room and that you can hear me. If so, the floor is yours. Loud and clear, thank you for your introduction. Um... My name is Matthijs van der Goot, I work at Liespan. I am the uh, global lead for electric vehicles on the commercial side and I would like to introduce this topic by reviewing where are we standing. And this first slide shows us uh, where we are and, and the main conclusion here is that we have momentum. Uh, what I mean here is that we've been talking about electric vehicles for quite some years now, but you really see now that the numbers start making sense. Um, if you look at this graph, you see that in uh, Q2 2018, it was the first time we reached a number of uh, more than 400,000 electric vehicle registrations, um, which is a 77% growth compared to uh, one year ago. Uh, majority is China. Uh, I have to say that, um, uh, as also introduced uh, by, by Steven, it is still limited if you look into the totals, 1.5%, eh? 2%, uh, that is what we're still looking into. But I think we have momentum because you see now the growth numbers and you see that the numbers now start making sense. That's not only confirmed by the numbers, but on the next slide, it's also confirmed by the headlines we see nowadays in the media around it. Uh, some of the uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, journalisms like Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times are talking about electric vehicles all the time. Um, just to confirm a little bit why we think this is a good idea here, you see that, uh, for example, in the left corner, uh, Volkswagen, had the ones that uh, more or less started the old Dieselgate, is now working on an EV awareness campaign. Um, China, we uh, mentioned that they are uh, the leader, has 480 
seven different car makers that are involved in uh, uh, making electric cars. Um, you also see that the charging is becoming better in terms of technology. Yeah? You see now that uh, some, some of the charges have a capacity up to 475 kilowatt. Um, and you see also that governments are reacting not only on stimulating, uh, but also the other side of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the side to say we start blocking certain uh, non-electric vehicles like the city of London. Um, so all in all, um, good momentum. Um, and why is this relevant for you on the next slide? Uh, we believe that, uh, uh, as, as already introduced, uh, it, it has an impact on your CO2 figure. It has the corporate image there. Um, electric vehicles is the right way to combat uh, climate change and CO2. Um, you do see that even if you compare an electric vehicle with a uh, diesel engine, uh, completely dust to dust, uh, so the whole life cycle, so from absolutely nothing from the production uh, to the running to the de dismantling of the vehicles, you still see that uh, uh, even with uh, 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 conventional energy yeah, like coal, you see an uh, advantage for CO2 for electric, yeah, so it is the right way to combat CO2. Um, it gives the right uh, solution for low emission zones um, and it becomes part of your corporate and social, social responsibility strategy. Yeah? So all reasons why to do this. Um, However, the question is uh, therefore some much, okay, when to start, not so much uh, if should we do this, uh, should, uh, it's more like when and how to start, because it is not all that positive. There are still, still hurdles and misconceptions. Um, so we summarize the most, the most common hurdles and misconceptions on the next slide. Uh, this is the ones that we uh, most commonly hear. Um, ranging from they are not that sustainable to um, if you if you have to drive electric I cannot do business they have just not enough range they are not available they are too expensive my drivers don't want it um, so so let's have a review on all of these topics in more detail to see where we're standing so let's start with the sustainability part um, so what we believe is that they are more sustainable than traditional vehicles as I introduced already in terms of total CO2 from a uh, uh, dust to dust comparison um, you do see that if you are a sustainable company in general, based on research, that you outperform the market and that this is the right thing to do in terms of corporate image. Um, go to the next uh, concept, misconception or the next hurdle uh, is the business continuity. Yeah? We, we hear customers saying, well, we cannot drive electric because we can't do business. Uh, it's starting to be the other way around. You need electric to do business. Uh, and why is that? Because of the low emission zones, the so-called city bands, there are more and more of them in Europe, there's more than 200 of them already. Um, but that's not the only argument you see also now that uh, customers of you, uh, you, the customers of our customers, are asking for sustainability policies and to have in place to do business at the first place. Uh, for example, if you want to do business at airport areas, you need to have a policy regarding electric vehicles in order to, to, be, to do business there at the first place. Um, if we continue to the next slide, you see about the range, that's uh, still a very uh, big hurdle. But if you look into the details and the facts, you actually see that the latest generation of electric vehicles all have a range of more than 200 kilometers. Um, and that is sufficient in most use cases. Uh, why is that? 77% is actually below 150 of the daily trips. Uh, and 95% is actually below that uh, range of 200. So 95% of the trips on average can be done with the current generations without any need for uh, charging during the way. 5% still need to have highway charging or on the road charging, but 95% can already be covered with the current generation. Um, and just to convert a little bit, or get a little bit more feeling about what does that daily range mean for my annual mileage, uh, feed manager no annual mileage, um, if you drive every day 200 kilometers, you go up to an, ever, to an annual mile of 73,000. That's, of course, not realistic because you don't drive every day. Um, but just to give you an idea, okay, what is the current mileage of those vehicles uh, that can already be achieved with the current generation? Um, going to the next slide, uh, if it comes down to charging, this is new. Eh? If an electric vehicle, uh, the, the vehicle part, we, we we as an industry more or less understand. Um, but now the new part is the charging part. And this is new to many of us. This is also uh, not, not easy. Uh, that has a challenge here, but just to see, okay, what are the different ranges of charging at the moment? You see on the left side, the AC charging, that's typical of the home charging, uh, that has a charging capacity up to 22 kilowatt, depends on your installation and your home uh, installation, which takes around three hours to charge a full uh, uh, vehicle if you have the 22 kilowatt. Realistically, many households have only 3.7 kilowatt and then takes longer. 
Uh, there's also the fast charging, and then there's a range of them from 50 kilowatts up to uh, 350. Um, all different networks that are at the moment rolling out in Europe, um, from Ionity, from the Tesla fast charging network, to really cover that need that you have on the highway next to the city centers to charge also in a relatively fast time. Uh, because if with the Ionity network, uh, a car of 60 kilowatt hour it takes only 10 minutes. Then that is where we are in terms of technology. That it only has to take 10 minutes to charge a full car. Um, to go to the next slide. Then the next question is, of course, okay, but where are the vehicles? What's the availability of them? So here it is a range of the vehicles that we currently, uh, what are currently available in the market, uh, including the, the the times. And what you see now is that there is momentum, and that means that there we have already in a set of around 10 to 12 cars that can be ordered if they are full electric, and you can see them here on the screen. Um, uh, all having that range of uh, 200 kilometers realistically, yeah? so I'm talking about WLTP range, so realistic range, uh, and even the high-end gen like Tesla, Jaguar, has that up to, up to 500. Uh, and you see that, and I keep repeating myself, that we have momentum, and what I mean there is that also next year, there are many, many vehicles to be launched. Uh, the Paris Motor Show will tell us more. Uh, but think about Tesla Model 3, yeah, the first D-segment vehicle, the Kia Nera is coming, the Volvo is coming, the Volkswagen is about to launch. So there are quite some more accessible vehicles for fleet that will be launched next year as a full electric version, also with even a better range than that 200 kilometers. Um, so you see, see good improvements there. But that's about availability. Uh, if you just want to confirm what OEMs are doing, uh, I've listed here on this slide their uh, public statements in terms of which year will they have a full lineup of electric vehicles. Uh, so how you how can you read this um, this graph? You see the OEMs on the left side and the year on the, on the right side. And by that year, they have announced that they will have a full lineup of all of the vehicles in an electric version. Uh, can be both plug in as full electric version. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't offer diesel and petrol vehicles. Eh? It just means that they offer an electric vehicle. Uh, and that period is coming by, coming nearby. Eh? This is the upcoming years. You see more and more models to be introduced. Um, so the future is uh, electric uh, for OEMs. Then the cost element, very, very important, TCO. What do we see with the TCO? It's going down for battery electric. And that's also why we're talking about it now, because what's happening, you see that those electric vehicles can offer an acceptable range against an acceptable cost level. And why is that? That has to do with two factors. First of all, the batteries production goes up. You can see here on the graph on the left side, the global uh, production of batteries uh, increasing in terms of enormous. Everyone is investing in this. I think uh, Angela Merkel uh, announced yesterday or the day before also that Europe should invest more in the battery production. Eh? It's now mostly coming from China and US. I think Europe should also start producing batteries themselves. Um, it's not only that the production goes up, you also see that the price of those batteries is going down. And uh, this graph on the right shows that we are now on $78 around seven, uh, per, per kilowatt uh, hour. My expectation is that we will soon hit that $100 per kilowatt hour, which is a, a, a price level that you can see that you can really produce electric vehicles against a very attractive TCO. And why attractive? Because if you compare it to diesel and petrol, you see that uh, not only the uh, the battery is going down, uh, the price of battery is going down. But you just see if you compare it on a TCO level, is that electricity is of course cheaper than uh, fuel, uh, two thirds, half of the price than, than what you pay in with a comparable uh, diesel or petrol vehicle. Um, you see that m almost all government in Europe favor electric vehicles in terms of registration tax, in terms of uh, running tax, in terms of driver tax. Uh, so the taxation is very favorable for electric vehicles. Um, and you see that because it is more or less an electric as a computer on wheels, you see that uh, the RMT cost of those vehicles, uh, the repair and maintenance costs, are significantly lower because they just don't need that much maintenance because there's not so much to maintain. But that's about the cost level. I do see that in certain level, a certain market, the TCO comparable is already that uh, that's more favorable for electric vehicles. Uh, think about Norway, think about the Netherlands, where you have many vehicles that are in favor for, for from a TCO perspective for electric than, uh, than non-electric. All the markets are getting close uh, or some models are already there. Um, and another element that is very important for the for the electrification is the drivers. You see actually the drivers do, do, do very much like and enjoy driving electric. Yeah? 
the, the main arguments and no fuel pipe emissions and it's good for the uh, local environment um, they drive fast and you're silent uh, you don't uh, so most of those electric vehicles you don't need that brake anymore because if you just release your gas of your, your your pedal you will brake automatically so you have a one pedal driving experience and also the drivers in most cases uh, pay less driver taxation so all, all arguments to do it and you can also see in some some of the research we looked into um, that those drivers who drive electric don't want to switch back to a normal uh, traditional combustion engine eh, because they're just so much enjoying it. So all arguments saying hmm, it seems to be the right momentum for electric vehicles. Um, having said that, I think it's also good to review, okay, but how to start? Knowing all these facts and these figures, great, but how can we start? So let's review some of the most common introduction ways uh, strategies and the, the overall uh, feedback I would like to provide here is start simple. Don't overcomplicate this. Uh, just start with a couple of cars, uh, get the experience. Um, and one of the, the most effective ways is, for example, to provide electric vehicles for senior management. Uh, there are some quite attractive vehicles in that segment available. Uh, think about Tesla, think about Jaguar, think about soon the uh, Audi e-tron. Um, very effective in terms uh, lead by example start at the top is a very effective way of, of, of getting electrification in your fleet. Um, and also include evs in your policy what i mean there is don't exclude them don't ban them show them under certain circumstances that they that you allow drivers get the experience show how it feels um and instead of of, of uh, banning them uh, do be, be aware and this is not an easy trans transition to us electric you need to support your drivers and also we as at the leasing companies uh, provide as much as possible uh, because it is new it is for many uh, drivers the first time you drive an electric vehicle so a lot of things are different so it's good to have as good support as possible um, another way to introduce them is a shared vehicle. Eh? So if you have an office location, why don't you just start with one vehicle, a shared pool car um, that people can experience, can drive, they know how it is to 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 um, to charge them, how to drive it. Uh, that, that that those is a very effective introduction method. Um, what we say always, uh, what we always recommend is if you drive, if you provide electric cars, always uh, make sure that they can charge it, which is logical, and how to charge. Um, Think about workplace chargers at the office, at the work sites, and home chargers. If the drivers are allowed or are possible to have a home charging, please install it because the best way to drive an electric vehicle is to have that overnight charge where you just drive all day long and then at night you fully charge your vehicle and that way you never have to go to a uh, uh, highway charger or only when you go on holiday. That's, that's the most effective way by having a home charger. Um, that's how to start. The next question on the next slide is where to start. Uh, in order to, to support that, we have created, an, uh, let's call it the maturity readiness index. Um, we looked into certain elements that are important for electric vehicles, such as how many of those electric vehicles are there in a country, uh, how many charging stations are there in a the country, um, how many tax incentives are there. And if you combine that all in a model, you see that here on the screen, there's a list a ranking of certain countries where we believe it makes sense to start uh, in these markets. Um, what I'm not saying here is don't start, uh, never start do electric in those uh, countries in the bottom. Uh, I'm just saying that it's more, uh, it will be more challenging to, to start there. Uh, it is easier to start at the, the countries here at the top. Um, that's about what I would like to say. So as a quick summary, and future is electric, very much supported by uh, OEMs and uh, all the direction is moving to electric. Um, so it is the future and uh, very interesting that in <coughs> over time we are also thinking about models as the industry, as uh, the leasing companies as well. How can we use your car as an energy provider? Because there is a lot of capacity in your batteries in those vehicles uh, that, we can, that we can think about how to leverage that. Um, we believe there are no uh, significant hurdles anymore uh, to start. Eh? I'm not saying here uh, go for a uh, completely uh, one day switch to full electric because that it is complicated, uh, but there are, uh, you can start. Um, and also because the battery cost is going down, uh, the charging options are improving, the OEMs are improving. Again, start simple and lead by example. That's what I would like to tell. In this call, and now I would like to give the word to Peter Gosens from Adlon. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Matthijs. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think this was the, the perfect introduction uh, for the, the detailed case that we have for you this afternoon. 
Uh, as Matthias said, uh, we also noticed that the uh, uh, that the, the speed is picking up, that there is momentum uh, for EVs, and uh, well, the case being that uh, Atlon has its headquarters uh, and and quite a big operations in uh, the Netherlands, which was all the way at the top uh, of uh, the list that uh, Matthias showed you. We uh, decided to uh, to check out and to 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 start a, a rollout program of electrifying the fleet of that main office. Uh, what office are we talking about? You see the details before you. It is our main international and Atlon Netherlands uh, HQ. So there's uh, over 400 people uh, working there. Uh, it currently has 21 charging stations, which are constantly uh, occupied. Um, it is our main uh, Netherlands remarketing center. So there's over 20,000 uh, ex-lease uh, vehicles that are passing through that, uh, that operation uh, every year. And uh, of course, there is an increased uh, EV uh, activity since a couple of years in the Netherlands. So there are also EVs that need to be charged that are coming back through that uh, facility. And it is our main commercial hub. Uh, customers, uh, some of you might have uh, visited it. Uh, suppliers uh, come there all the time. So it is a showcase office where we would, of course, like to show um, that we are moving forward. Uh, if you would go to the next slide, uh, we would we have two questions to answer if you go into detail the first is of course who are your internal customers who's your user and to make it easier when we're talking to HR and we're talking to uh, uh, to facilities is to use uh, personas and you might know these people uh, we use Mark and uh, Mary and we we gave them a profile based on whether or not they had uh, availability of private parking, what type of job uh, they did. Uh, we, Of course, the price of the charging uh, is taking into account and what kind of vehicle uh, they drive. A uh, current smaller EV has between 40 and 50 kilowatt hours of, of, uh, of power uh, in the battery. It's like the Renault Zero or the uh, Zoe or the uh, um, BMW i3. You have the mid-sized vehicles like the Opel Ampera E and the Hyundai uh, Kona who have uh, 60 or more. And then you have the real big executive saloons who go all the way up to 100 uh, kilowatt hours. Now, if you go to the next slide, you quickly realize that these two persona uh, have a completely different um, type of usage. Uh, Mark is an account manager, so he will have days where he arrives with his uh, almost empty vehicle because he does. He lives in an apartment and he cannot charge the vehicle uh, during the weekend, uh, and he will have to leave the office quite quickly again. While Mary, who actually drives the car with the bigger battery, uh, is will be staying in the office all day while she arrives with a battery that is still 80% full. So we will need in the future to have quite a detailed view on the usage profiles of our users. For our office in Almere, we use the mix of 70% marks uh, because the account managers typically have a company car. Uh, they, uh, the Dutch office in Almere typically has a population where people do not have a, uh, a charging possibility at home. And we counted with 30% uh, marries. That's not the only question there is to be answered. The other question is, of course, also what are your facilities like? What do you have available? Well, we have a 600 kilowatt grid connection, one that goes outside. So up until that point, it's quite simple. But then, of course, given that it is both an office and a remarketing uh, operation, there it becomes a little more uh, difficult. We have three lines uh, running into the remarketing center as it was not built in one go. We have already 21 existing chargers uh, on the uh, premises that are being used mostly by uh, plug-in uh, vehicles and the maximum load ever measured in two or three years that we could go back uh, in, in time was 439 kilowatt. So we have a, a quite a big gap between the maximum power ever consumed and the uh, availability. Uh, determining all that information is quite messy. Uh, we'll be very transparent. You need electricity invoices that are not always easy to find because they don't go to uh, our own office. They go to uh, often to the mother uh, company. 
uh, there is the fact that we don't own the building, but we rent it. Uh, it is uh, when buildings aren't built in one go, uh, you have to establish the building plans. So it's a, it's, it, is a, it is a project that you cannot complete in just uh, two or three days. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we, I'll give you the profiles that we used. Uh, we, went, we started from the worst case scenario. Uh, what would happen on a cold winter Monday morning after a long weekend where all the marks have been going to hockey and uh, grandparents and what have you not. And um, we counted with them needing about 50 kilowatt hours of uh, charging. The Marys of our office, uh, well, they, uh, they don't need that much to charge because they are able to charge at home over the weekend. And we counted with a normal nine to five um, working day in which the vehicles are actually present in the uh, office of the people working, of course. And then on the next slide, you will see the uh, results. Uh, when we did the calculations, the, um, we did two, we started from two uh, situations, one that includes fast charging, direct current fast charging, and one without. On the left, you can see the, uh, the, the, the analysis without fast charging. And it basically tells us that we have space for 24 extra charging stations in the, on that Monday morning. And just to make very clear, it is under the circumstances defined in the slides uh, above. If we want to reserve uh, 100 kilowatts for the fast charging, for, for visitors, for suppliers, for, for urgent needs within our remarketing center, there is only space left for 12, maybe uh, for 24 uh, charging stations. So that was quite a sobering uh, analysis, especially for a building that, that has a few hundred uh, employees. And But if you go to the next slide, it did provide perfect guidance for the local uh, management team. Um, we clearly saw that the remarketing operation is not an issue. The cars are sitting in the office uh, also during the evening, the morning, and the night, so you have uh, plenty of time to, to charge them. They sit there for a long time, so um, they, they don't need high power. We also know that uh, home charging uh, by employees should be uh, maximized as much as possible, even if the costs are a bit higher than the, the office. Um, we also learned that employees with an external role, like account managers, they need a charging card to uh, charge publicly when uh, needed. And uh, we also know that on certain days, the office power will never cover uh, the, uh, the peak needs. Uh, so we will need a charging policy. Who gets priority? Uh, will we base it on role? Will we base it on rank? Uh, will we base it on the distance you live uh, from the uh, office? All of those things will have to be taken into account. It will be an and, and, and story, which is strategically very important for the local uh, management team. And, and the biggest message that I have uh, to give you is uh, you need information. You need a lot of information on your facilities, which is not something from a fleet management side we're used to uh, collecting. And you need a lot more information on your users like whether or not they have the possibility of a private, par private parking spot where they can uh, charge and what their typical private usage uh, profile is. I hope this uh, helped uh, give some guidance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Peter Jolse Zawatlon for giving insight in the case study that you are running at Atlon headquarters in the Netherlands. And also, thank you very much, Matthijs, Matthijs van der Jood of Leaseplan for detailing the why and the how uh, it can be interesting to electrify your fleet today. Now we are going to the final chapter of this IFMI webinar. And that is, of course, the Q&A, questions and answers. So as you can see on your screen, you can send your questions for our experts by using the chat function on your screen. Um, I will be moderating this little session. So if you have a question related to fleet electrification, 
related to the TCO, related to the batteries, related to the cost elements, the sustainability, please send it and I will deal with the questions together with the experts here in the webinar room. I see that the first questions are already entering, so that is really good. Um, the first question, Peter, uh, for you. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for the interesting case study. Can you tell us uh, how many people uh, in the Adlon headquarters uh, are using, let's say, electric vehicles at this moment? And what is a little bit the outlook? Um, the the current well, it depends. If you talk uh, full electric vehicles, there's uh, that it's it's quite limited. Um, but we do have uh, a lot of plug-in hybrids, and we've had them traditionally. And given that we don't have enough chargers, uh, it's clear that uh, there's uh, there's uh, 30 to 50 uh, plug-in hybrids on site. And slowly but surely, the number uh, number of uh, full EVs uh, is in uh, increase. I recently saw. A Jaguar I-Pace uh, parked uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the charging uh, area, so they uh, they are uh, it is increasing. Okay, um, you mentioned in your conclusions, uh, I think it was the second or third conclusion that you said, well, uh, employees with home charging possibilities should maximize this solution. Why? Um, the, uh, the, the, the basic reason is that, uh, like Matthias all, all also said, the easiest way to use electric vehicles is to, chart, to start out every morning with a full battery. We're not used to that with uh, petrol and, and diesel. It is really a change uh, to, to in, in perspective. And it will help uh, as the penetration of full EVs increases. Those people at least don't arrive at the office with a very big urgent need uh, to charge and we can give priority to those uh, employees that do not have their own private uh, charging possibility at, uh, at home. So it is a, a practical uh, countermeasure to make sure that uh, you can actually get your entire, uh, that you can get all, your, all of your fleet uh, charged on those days where there are a lot of people in the office with uh, almost empty batteries. Okay, uh, question for Matthijs. Matthijs, um, based on, uh, let's say, the experience that you have as EV leader at Leaseplan and also the studies that you have done, uh, do you think that every multinational company should today ask the question how to include EVs in their fleet or do you say, well, there are at least some conditions in terms of the corporate organization that have to be fulfilled before that you can even start with that question? Uh, absolutely the first part. I think everyone, every multinational can start electric, um, if, even if you have an uh, LCV fleet. Um, there is always possibilities and I think it is important in this stage to get that experience, to get those cars on the road, um, to get the experience with an electric vehicle, how does it work with charging, how do electric vehicles behave. It is uh, very important to get that experience now uh, before um, uh, uh, things are things, uh, getting, getting very much difficult. Um, I'm not saying that everyone can drive an electric vehicle all the time already without any uh, um, uh, this, without any concern, so to say. Uh, but definitely everyone can start, and that's also my advice. Um, please start electric uh, by by some of the simplest uh, ways of introducing it uh, and get that experience. Okay. Um, a question for Peter. Um, Peter. Can you tell the audience who was taking the lead for this electric vehicle project? Was it a special division? Was it you? Uh, was it top management? How came it together? Uh, I thought that is <laughs> the focus on electric uh, was, uh, was 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 taken almost ten ten years ago. Uh, I think so. So we've been focusing on electric uh, for quite some time. I can't really retrace uh, for this specific topic uh, which uh, who took uh, who took the lead. Uh, there's quite a lot of interest from customers, of course. So it's, it is it is a commercially 
data-driven uh, uh, question uh, within the company, and and that's immediately also the 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 message uh, when you're doing a project like this, um, you run into every department uh, you need uh, you need finance is very interesting what is it going to cost to get the buildings equipped um, the, the HR department is uh, is interested in how how are we going to write the policies around charging and, and cost distribution um, the uh, top management of course has to has to cover uh, has to cover everything so I, facilities is very interested because uh, they uh, they actually need to get all the information together and to manage uh, the charging infrastructure, so I don't I don't really remember. I think it was more a a common feeling of everyone realizing uh, if if this keeps going in in that direction, we really have to sit down and and study the details uh, uh, from a little bit closer before we uh, run into uh, difficulties. Mm -hmm. Okay, a uh, question for Matthijs. Matthijs, uh, you give us insight with some facts and figures regarding the current and future offering of electric vehicles. You also present to the grid of countries, let's say, that are already quite attractive or less attractive when it comes to uh, fleet electrification. Now, uh, some fleet managers here in the room they would like to know is there any advice is there any solution which allows them to have let's say a sort of a digital consultancy approach to identify the best ev car for the drivers in in function of the profile the travel that they are doing and so on is there some guidance that exists or that you can give yeah, what we we'll typically do is we, we do look into um, the fleet uh, in terms of what is your uh, driving population. And I think uh, Peter Peter did it very clearly with his uh, scenarios for the charging part, but you can do more or less the same for the, for the fleet part. Eh? You can uh, look into what are the drivers, how much is the mileage. Uh, you, you can think about how they use it. Eh? If they just commuting, uh, it's relatively easily to go for an electric vehicle because of the range uh, you have then and the, 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 uh, the, your, your workplace charges. If they are sales uh, type of roles. Uh, you, you, it is possible, uh, but you need to look into how to make that possible and what do we need to change to make that possible. Um, so there's all different types of use cases that you can look into um, and that you can see, okay, well, for this, this type of population, we, we start electric. Um, and also what we also say is it's the easiest way to start is with the higher higher level management and to give the right example, lead by example, and also because there are just very attractive vehicles available for them at the moment with a very acceptable range. Um, so it's definitely uh, advisable to look into this a bit more detail than just consider uh, the, the complete fleet at once. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, some questions related to charging, because that seems quite an interesting element and uh, i'm going to read some of the questions uh, i think that peter you can start um, the question is around home charging peter can you detail who pays for the electric power is it the company or the user uh, <laughs> if you want uh, the uh, if you want the uh, electric uh, vehicles to be a success in your fleet it is it is the person who is now paying for the diesel or the petrol, which in an enormous amount of the cases, except for some exceptions, uh, will be uh, the company. So what we typically do is we install the home charging with a uh, with a, uh, a badging or, or or the technology to make sure that all of those kilowatt hours that are charged into the vehicle that they are reimbursed to the owner of the uh, charging. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, usually it is the, the, the person, the private person at home, so that he gets reimbursed uh, and that we invoice that to the um, to the employer of that uh, of that person. So pretty much the same the same as with fuel, except that you charge at home instead of at a fuel fuel station. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Peter or Matthijs, uh you can see who is going to answer first. Um, the question is related also with regard to charging. Um, there is a possibility, of course, that you can charge at the office, 
that means that uh, probably there has to be charging uh, close to or in with the building. Uh, what if electrification of the corporate fleet really takes off and uh, our cars charge more than our building can deliver? Are there any technological opportunities that you see coming to resolve that possible issue? Uh, yeah, I can, I can answer that one. It's called load balancing, and that is a typical solution that you see now in the workplace charges. Uh, and basically, what that does is it looks into it, monitors the amount of capacity available and the demand, and it will make sure you will never go above the actual amount that you have available. Uh, and with the load balancing, um, uh, you have that uh, as a technology wise, you have it already in place. Um, and what it does, it, it will make if the demand is too high, it will uh, distribute the amount of capacity over um, the, uh, of the vehicles. Uh, and that basically means that some of the vehicles will be charged uh, less fast than the maximum capacity, just to make sure you have enough capacity for running uh, the rest of your office, that you don't get any blackouts. And I could I could add uh, to that because because clearly in in the Almere office at some point we will uh, we will run out of uh, uh, grid capacity where there are three main solutions in in the longer term uh, load balancing in in the short term. Um, the, the, the numbers that are in the slides are based on, on a load balancing a solution of, of spreading out the charging during the day like, uh, during the day, like uh, Matthias said. Uh, the second solution is, of course, the simple one that is increasing your grid connection, uh, just asking your power supplier to uh, give you a bigger line into the building. It is in many cases not cheap. Uh, third solution is on-site battery storage, uh, which is basically a solution where you install a fixed battery on your site that gets filled up during the night when there's very little demand and that is used uh, during the day to charge uh, the vehicles. And then one specific solution, but it is very far into the future and specific for those customers like us in this case, where you probably have a lot of vehicles with uh, batteries standing still in the remarketing center, but I can imagine that there's customers who have, for example, vans that are parked during the night, uh, or during during the day or, or during uh, the, the charging time to use those vehicles who have vehicle uh, to grid capability to charge vehicles that have a need. But in all honesty, the technology is there with some OEMs, but it is still being tested, so we are we're talking about uh, quite a few years in, in the distance for that solution. Okay, good. Um, gentlemen, um, you uh, have all taken uh, initiatives in terms of fleet electrification. We've seen the case of Atlon. Uh, lease plan is also at the forefront of electrification uh, within the EV100 initiative. Um, just for us to know, um, when you present, let's say, such a fleet electrification program, how do you deal then with the fact that there might be some kind of resistance within the employee base? Because, of course, it will come with questions, with some kind of issues, with concerns and so on. Or wasn't that the case within your companies? Perhaps we can start with Peter. I think I think we're we're, we're a normal company just like uh, just like any other. Uh, if if anything, we're uh, we're a little bit more attached to uh, to cars than, uh, than 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 some others. I think. Um, so there is the normal resistance, and I think Matthias already gave 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 uh, a lot of good clues. Uh, top management um, showing by example, leading by example, is a very important one. Um, a very important one is also to give people access to the vehicles uh, before they have to make a long-term decision uh, to to have them try a vehicle for for not just for a day because that's not good enough they have to live with it uh, for for at least a week uh, to 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 help them see ah, this 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 works perfectly um, so it is it is about uh, getting people into the vehicles uh, and and living with them and, and feeling that 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 there is not actually that much uh, to be to be afraid of and and Matthias had a very nice slide about drivers who actually like 
driving electric, it is quiet, it, it's, uh, it's a lot less stressful, it is better for the environment, uh, it is for those sporty drivers out there, it is very fast. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, using, using the new technology is, is the best way to, uh, to overcome the challenge. Okay, and Matthijs? Yeah, I think very much in line with what Peter told us. Maybe to add, to add to this, I think we, within at least in our internal policy, it has to be full electric. Uh, there is no other choice. Uh, and one of the key key learnings here is that it has to be very strong emphasized by the, the, the senior management. So basically, they said if you do, if you work full leaspawn, you drive electric, and that's a very clear statement uh, that our vision, our strategy is based on uh, moving to an electric world. Um, and all the senior management is very much keen saying, well, if you if you want to work at least from you drive electric and that's it. Um, that's not easy because there's many, as as, as Peter uh, nicely uh, described, uh, we uh, uh, so-called petrol heads, eh, those who really love their uh, their vehicles, especially in leasing companies. Um, but it's a very strong message that it needs to be very much supported with the top management. Otherwise, um, this goes slower and you get into more more uh, uh, resistance. So if if you have a very good buy-in from the senior management and they keep repeating the same message, it's a very strong uh, way of implementing this. Okay, Peter, um, a very practical question. Uh, what do you do when uh, someone who has taken, let's say, a full electric car uh, is going, for example, on holiday, he lives, you know, in the Netherlands, he goes on holiday in the south of Spain. Is there a possibility that he uses another car or how does it work? Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's basically... Uh... Uh, two solutions towards the future, uh, and, and I think Tesla has shown the way there, um, except that it will take a little bit more time because you have to stop from time to time to uh, to charge, uh, but it's really, really a lot less than what people are imagining. It's just taking your own car and going on that holiday. It's, it's a holiday, so uh, chill and, and enjoy it. Um, if, if not, there, there are solutions available like, uh, like at, at Athlon FlexDrive, where we, uh, where you into your budget can take a, uh, a a sort of like a savings account, where you have a, a budget available for temporary rentals um, in uh, in your holiday, uh, even at your holiday destination. So you would not even have to drive down to Spain. You would you could fly and and rent a vehicle. Uh, vehicle there and save yourself two days of uh, of, of highway uh, driving. Uh, so the solutions are uh, are available uh, in the market, um, and uh, and and we can we can definitely help uh, people uh, get to the right uh, get to the right solution. Okay, uh, Matthijs, uh, a, a question for you. Um, it's related also to the interesting information that you have been given. Um, do you have an analysis of the electricity production in the countries where, uh, where you are de deploying EVs to avoid, for example, the spread of EV charging with electricity produced from coal? You know, uh, do you also have an analysis on where the electricity comes from, how it is produced? Do you take that also into consideration in, let's say, if a country is less or more electric friendly? Um, so, it's not an easy question, and that has to do because there's a lot of local production in terms of electricity. Uh, it's also very hard to, to, to see where it's actually coming from. Huh? Electricity is electricity. You don't really see where what that, where it's coming from. If you It's just about uh, uh, who's produ producing it. Uh, of course, it is uh, available to see the general uh, production uh, in a country of, in terms of renewable energy. Uh, luckily, that, that share is growing over time. Um, but if it comes down to an electric vehicle, you see that 60% of the time it is actually charged at home. Um, at the moment, you see that that is very hard to influence uh, for, 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 for a corporation and because it's most of the time just uh, uh, sourced with the actual employee. Uh, he has an own home home charger installation and then uh, contract 
um, and you don't really have the, the the influence there yet to say, okay, I need that to be in a green uh, contract. Um, Thirty percent is charged at the offer set. That's a little bit what we see now. That is, of course, easy to influence because at the end of the time, it's your office. You are in charge of what type of electricity comes in there. Uh, so you can source it to a, to a re renewable source. Uh, and ten percent is the highway charging, and that is really uh, the, the public charging. Um, and that is really depending where it's coming from, uh, which city, where it's location, which uh, charge unit. So that's very hard to say, okay, we, we can only uh, focus on those renewable uh, energy there. But the, the, the offers charges uh, around 30% of your charging time uh, is very much influenceable by what type of electricity coming from. Uh, home charging is not there yet, but will will hopefully come soon where we can also influence that type of electricity. Uh, if it comes down to a net national EU or even a European-wide um, share, uh, those figures are available. Yeah, uh, but not very detailed because in the end it's one pool of electricity, um, and it's not something that you can uh, uh, touch. Saying I only, uh, well, it 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 works like different electricity, of course. Okay, um, Peter, uh, do you think that it can be a good idea? To uh, take away, as you uh, imagine that you are a fleet manager and that you want to promote, let's say, EVs, could it be a good idea to take away budget from ICE cars and put that into a higher EV budget for your employees, or is that not really a good approach? <laughs> that, that, that would mean taking away budget from one person and, and giving it to the other. I would not recommend uh, that, uh, that 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 course of action from from an HR perspective. If it if it if, if the question is uh, does it make sense to uh, to budgetarily uh, promote EVs, uh, that 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 is a good idea. We've seen we've seen customers do it uh, in the past. The good news story is that, like Matthias said, in a lot of countries from a TCO perspective. Um, that that is actually not necessary uh, anymore, and and we see we see a lot of countries. It depends a lot on the fiscal situation, but we see a lot of countries moving in the right direction. Where if you just uh, honestly put together your budgets on a TCO uh, basis, including the fuel, in including the total taxation, uh, you will automatically end up with EVs that are competitive and 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 often often EVs are also quite well equipped uh, because they are the first vehicles uh, or with among the first vehicles of the OEMs so people can have uh, uh, employees can have a, a, a car that is as nicely spec and very often uh, with with better specs than uh, than the comparable ICE uh, vehicle so uh, it is it is a good idea to promote them but I would not penalize anyone who is choosing the, uh, the, uh, the the petrol or the diesel? The the mix of vehicles available is just not big enough yet. If you have four kids and an, an external role in a country that is more towards the bottom of of Matthias's list, um, it's 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 quite very simple. There is maybe not the the ideal for EV for you yet, and you'll have to uh, you'll have to do another cycle with. Uh, with a petrol or a diesel car. Okay. And for you, Matthijs, what is, let's say, a good approach to try to push EVs within your corporate fleet? Um, you, you mean from, from a lease fund own employee sector or just the recommendations for, our, for, for the clients? For the recommendations for the clients. Um, yeah, I think start simple. Huh? Um, start now. Um, don't overcomplicate it. Uh, it is possible. Uh, start with a shared car. Start with a car that multiple can, can multiple drivers can experience. Uh, start with those where who want it. Uh, I think this is also very stimulated with um, those drivers who are keen on this and if they like it, they want to figure this out. They want to do it. Uh, allow so um, and get that experience. I think that is very keen at this moment. Uh, not to wait too long. Not to uh, miss the boat. Not to. Uh, uh, um, get, gain the experience now, now and start. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much, Matthijs. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for, ask, uh, for answering our questions. We will now come to an end of this uh, IFMI webinar. As you can see, there is a recorded version of the webinar for those people who want to review, you would say, the interesting content that Matthijs and Peter have been given. We will also send you a little satisfaction survey. And then finally, we would like to invite you for our upcoming IFMI Masterclass linked to the Fleet Europe Summit in Barcelona on the 27th of November, where we will go into detail talking about some upcoming trends and how you can turn your fleet and mobility management strategy into an even better one for tomorrow and in the future. And throughout the program that will be based on workshops and case studies, um, we will also include change management because, for example, with fleet electrification, I can imagine that you have to sell, let's say, a new initiative in your company. And so this will ask also for some changes within your organization. So in the IFMI Masterclass on 27 November uh, in Barcelona, we will talk about how to optimize your fleet management strategy with a focus on change management. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day. Bye-bye.